During my 35 years of psychiatric practice, I have had to deal with many children who were sexually abused and with many adults who were abused in their childhood. And also, I did many psychiatric examinations of abusers for the courts in, I don't know how it's here in Switzerland, it's, very, it's usually the judge who appoints an expert, uh, let's say a psychiatric expert, when there is a psychiatric question, for instance, if the state of mind of, in that case, an abuser has to be evaluated. And then one has to work very carefully. One has to see the man or the woman maybe about 20 or 30 hours. One has to see another 10 hours of family and the surrounding and the teachers and the, and the workmates and so on. And then one has to write a long report of about 40 or 50 pages. So uh, when you work for a court with an abuser, you get to know these people very well, although, of course, although you don't do therapy with them. Because in recent years, the public and professionals became more aware of sexual child abuse, I decided two years ago to give a course on this topic at the C.G. Jung Institute in Zurich. And to, that, to do that, <coughs> I studied older and newer literature to understand a little bit better what I was dealing with. Now, the, the literature, the books, the brochures, the articles about these topics turned out to be extremely confusing. For instance, some authors claimed that half of all the children half of all the girls were sexually abused and suffered great psychological damage through that abuse. Others maintained that only a very small percentage of the children, maybe about 5 to 15 percent, were actually confronted with damaging sexual abuse. And what struck me was that many authors were rather vague about what they mean by sexual child abuse. Some included everything from a pat on the shoulder of a so-called friendly uncle to an actual brutal sexual intercourse. Or dreadful abuse of children between the ages of four to six were usually lumped together with sexual experience of girls or boys of 15 with older men. Especially modern experts are sometimes inclined to consider any kind of sexual experience of a child with an adult as extremely damaging, while others question that. For instance, a third, and there's just some statistics, statistics all vary, but for instance, in one article, a third, it claimed that a third of all sexual child abuse, as it usually appears in statistics, refers to experiences with exhibitionists. But one can ask the question, does the sight of an exhibitionist really deeply damage a girl or a boy of, say, 12 years of age? One can ask the question, I don't know, so yes or no, but one can ask a question, is that the same as being brutally abused with, uh, when you are eight year old <coughs> by a drunken stepfather? At the beginning, of my lecture at the C.G. Jung Institute, I emphasized, therefore, that it is very important to study sexual child abuse very carefully. I stressed that I want first to look objectively, one can never look at anything objectively, but as objectively as possible, so to speak, in a scientific way at the phenomenon, and then only draw my conclusions. Now, this approach produced passionate protests from the audience. Some of the women in the audience screamed at me and called me a pig. They said, understandably, now I understand that, they said, we are dealing here with a crime and not a phenomenon which has to be studied with a clear mind. Every form <coughs> of sexual involvement of an adult <clears throat> with a child 
not defining what is an adult and what is a child, whatever it may be, has to be considered a horrible crime and the only decent reaction can be one of rage and not of a desire to study it carefully. When I later mentioned that we even have to look at the offenders in a psychological way and try to understand what motivates them, some of the audience left in protest and reproached me that I was on the side of these disgusting criminals. Later, I met a group of incest survivors for a discussion on, on television. Some of them expressed very radical views. One of them, for instance, said, when you look in the evening out of the window and see how the father of the neighboring family sits down on the bed of his little girl and gives her a good night kiss, call the police immediately or get in touch with a social worker. Do everything that this father is at least temporarily removed from the house. Some of them insisted that every man, me and all the men in here, have to be considered potential child abusers and rapists. Never leave your husband alone at home with the children. Some of these uh, incest uh, victims, that some of these women advised their sisters. The most harmless man is able to sexually misuse any child, including his own physical child. After this lecture and this discussion, I was staying in England for a few weeks and read some English newspapers. And there were reports, which you, <coughs> of course, have better studied than I, there were reports about satanic child rights, about circles of pedophiles who sacrificed children, killed them, ate them, etc. It was described in a newspaper how in those satanic rites, children were induced to watch horrible mistreatments and tortures of other children so as to intimidate them and make them docile for sexual misuse, instilling so much fear into them that they would never tell anyone else about their experiences. The same kind of reports appeared in journals in, uh, in uh, California, uh, reports about satanic sexual killings of children. However, in the English articles and in the American ones, Every time at the end of these articles, it was mentioned that so far no evidence could be found of these satanic rites and that the police has not yet discovered a case of these satanic rites, not of child abuse. Some psychotherapists, however, claimed that they have reliable patients who told them that they were victims of such satanic rituals. Many patients seem themselves to have temporarily forgotten that they were victims of these satanic rites, but in the course of long analysis were reminded again that once they participated in these rites as small children. I then remembered from my school days the history of the Order of the Templars. That was a society of knights founded 1119 for the protection of the pilgrims to Jerusalem. The order was very wealthy, especially in France. After the fall of Akka in Palestine, their function became obsolete because hardly any pilgrims could travel to Jerusalem anymore. The order became disliked and suspicious. In 1305, they were accused of heresy and especially of sexual misdeed, misdeeds. They were accused of being homosexuals and abusing little boys and sometimes girls, or they were accused of secret satanic rites. In the end, this order was eliminated and erased, and many of them were burned at the stake. And I remembered from my studies of Jewish history how in the medieval ages, especially in Europe, 
Jews were accused of adopt, uh, uh, abducting children, Christian children, killing them and sacrificing them in satanic rites. And whenever these rumors started to spread, pogroms were the result and many Jews were killed. So there is apparently more involved in sexual child abuse than meets the eye. There are the facts of sexual child abuse, abuse, which we have to deal with often in our daily psychological or counseling or psychiatric work. These sad and frightening facts are just now very much in the center of public attention. attention. And it's very good that it is so because we have to do everything to prevent and to stop and to heal. But then we have to deal with a phenomenon which seems to be stimulated by this horrible fact of sexual child abuse, a phenomenon which is difficult to catch and to describe precisely, which has to do with the basic psychological attitude of the collective and individual conscious and unconscious. The concern which professional people in medicine and psychology and the interest which the public in general shows for a particular topic is not only connected with that particular topic itself. When something, a phenomenon, anything, is in the center of interest, we have to study two sides, two layers. The phenomenon into which we are interested and then the psychological background of the persons or the society which is or are interested in that topic. Everything which interests us is always an expression of our own psychological needs and visions as well, and again connected with our own collective mythological background. Today I shall not talk so much about the phenomenon of sexual child abuse per se, <clears throat> but I shall be more concerned about what this phenomenon provokes or stimulates in us or what needs it satisfies. I have to repeat again, the sexual child abuse, of course, is a very <clears throat> tragic and important phenomenon which has to be studied and investigated, but what it stimulates is important too. We live in a scientific age, and science sails under the flag of cause and effect. And this is adequate for the natural sciences, but not adequate for psychology. The psyche, after the psychology of C.G. Jung, is a-causal, is not ruled by causes, does not follow the law of cause and effect. What makes our psyche what characterizes our soul <clears throat> is the fact that this is a part of us which cannot be explained by causality. The psychic reality can only be expressed and approached through symbols, through images, and mythological, symbolical tales and stories. To put it extremely, all psychology is mythology or psychology is modern mythology. Somebody before the, this lecture just told me that he thinks that science too is mythology, which is probably true, but I will not go into that. Anyhow, psychology is mythology. However, the need for causality is very, very deep. Events frighten us less when we think we have found out the cause, and we hope too that by finding the cause, we can influence events can influence nature, the behavior of human beings, and are, and are able to heal. Oddly enough, nothing has stimulated psychological mythology so much than the need for causality. With our need for causes for human behavior, of human suffering and joy, we have in the last hundred years created innumerable psychological mythologies, mostly, however, believing that there are causes. 
you know all these so-called causes, let's say, for instance, of uh, neurosis, causes which are in reality psychological mythologies. Working mothers or non-working mothers, patriarchal fathers or absent fathers, too much discipline or too little discipline, sexual overstimulation or taboos against sexuality, too much closeness of parents and children, spoiling, or too much coldness of parents towards their children, oral, anal, genital frustrations, edible complications, lack of mirroring, false self, etc. The members of the older generation among you might remember that for decades, nearly centuries, masturbation was the so-called cause for all kinds of psychological disturbances and sufferings. By tying their hands, one tried to stop children from masturbating. The penises of little boys were put under electricity, a well-meant deterrent against harmful masturbation. Today, the mythological nature of all these ideas about the harm which masturbation has supposed to produce can be very easily seen, but that's after the event. When it was believed, it was believed as a fact. And it was preached by the medical man that masturbation is extremely harmful, and it went then into uh, popular images, as some people believe that in, by masturbation, uh, the liquid of the spine runs out and things like that. The search for simple, easily understood causes in psychology still goes on and over and over again produces very fruitful psychological mythologies. <clears throat> in recent years, more and more neurotic behavior has been explained as being the result of some kind of sexual child abuse. Some experts say, for instance, that up to 90% of all anorexia and bulimia is caused by sexual child abuse. By the way, causality in psychology cannot be dismissed altogether, but it has more to be understood as a symbolic image of connection. Different events in a human life are connected in a mysterious way. Difficult to understand, but not necessarily in a causal way. I shall mention now another attractive feature of the mythology of child abuse. However, first I must insist, again I have to do that a few times now, I must insist that there is of course, something like sexual child abuse, and an unbelievable amount of suffering is connected with it. But I'm talking here about a cloud of psychological mythology which surrounds this phenomenon. There is a naive belief or hope in most of us that good produces good and evil produces evil. This belief is a worldly form of a religious attitude or of a religious mythology. A, psychologi a psychological mythology is therefore especially attractive when it claims that the so-called cause which is behind much of, neurotically and, of neurotic and psychotic behavior is something evil. This gives us the emotion to fight against it, to direct our anger towards it. Sexual child abuse is, of course, a very evil deed, is amoral. So this mythology satisfies our moral needs. And it offers even more. Today, we live in a change from patriarchal to a matriarchal society. The change has already taken place in many fields. 
man might still dominate the political, the industrial, business life, and maybe the academic life. However, they have already lost many battles. Most families, at least in Switzerland, are nowadays matriarchically internally. Men have less and less to say within the family. Maybe that's different in England. This change from patriarchy to matriarchy is a result of a justified revolt of women against men. Even a, reject, a rejection or a temporarily necessary hate of everything male. Extreme feminists understandably see in the male species of humanity the reason of most evil. They claim, for instance, that war and political strife is the result of the domination of the male over the female. If women or women would rule the world, so they say and believe, then we would have eternal peace, not realizing that Aphrodite and Ares, the god of war, were lovers. Child abuse is not only the cause of most unfortunate psychological development, this cause is even evil, and the evildoer is even a man. So the cause, or mostly a man, so the cause of most of our psychological suffering, even of the suffering of humanity, is really the evil patriarch, the male brute, who, as a sideline, misuses sexual, sexually children whenever he has the opportunity. So this sexual child abuse mythology, misunderstood as a cause, satisfies many needs and this makes it all the harder for us first to investigate and look at the phenomenon fully and secondly deal with it adequately. The crusader and the fighter against crime <coughs> takes over, with ha which has its advantages too, but has its disadvantages too. Now you might understand why I aroused so much anger when I said in the introduction to my lecture about child abuse at the C.G. Jung Institute in Zurich, that we should first try to study the phenomenon of child abuse very carefully. This was the wrong attitude. The right attitude would be, you know what the cause is, and you know it's evil and criminal, and our duty is to fight it and not waste time in carefully studying it. The child abuse mythology has yet another aspect. I mentioned the discussion with groups of incest survivors. Some told me dreadful tales. Many experienced unbelievable suffering by their fathers or stepfathers or other men or by, or by, fa by other father figures and by the carelessness and neglect of their mothers. Other so-called incest survivors told fairly harmless stories such as a male teacher kept the 14-year-old girl after a class was dismissed in the room to help her with her homework. While sitting beside her, he gently stroked her over the hair and over the back. Or an elderly cousin told dirty jokes. Or a stepfather once looked at the 15-year-old stepdaughter when she went out for a dance with lecherous eyes. But whatever these stories were, most of these women felt injured and had a deep hate against the fathers or the father figures. Some of them thought the law should punish 
these criminals even 20 years after a dreadful deed had taken place. There should never be any possibility that the law could no more uh, persecute, prosecute them. Most of these women were very nice, very sensitive, and very perceptive and intelligent. The hate against the father or the father figures seemed to me to be so deep that I wondered if there was not a religious dimension to this hate. In some way, we are all abused children, sexually and otherwise. We are abused by God the Father, by, by God. Life as such, partially, through no fault of our own, can really be horrible. Disease tortures us, deficiencies make our life difficulty, difficult, misfortunes make us miserable, our Heavenly Father, in some ununderstandable way, mistreats us over and over again. I think it's rather unfortunate that we use as a symbol for God, Father. Sexuality is sometimes connected with love, with feeling. Even in sexual child abuse, Often loving feelings exist between abuser and abused. Now what better image could there be for the relation between God and us humans? God often seems lovingly to abuse us or at least claiming to love us and at the same time he abuses us. Or maybe these people wrestle not so much with God than with Satan, the dark side of God and his representatives on earth. I mentioned at the beginning of these lectures the rumors about satanic rites where children were sacrificed or frightened into obedience and eternal silence. So in the mythology of child abuse, we find the accumulation of archetypal symbols. The child, for instance, as such, is as such um, more than just John or Mary. The child as such is already the symbol of the divine child which can be found in nearly all religion, most markedly, or very markedly, however, in Christianity. The child Jesus, born in the stable of Jerusalem, was the beginning of a new area promising eventually heaven and paradise, salvation of humanity. Whenever something new, something which might save us, individually or collectively appears, it is usually symbolically represented by the child. The child is the savior. How much the child is a mythological symbol is seen by the phenomenon that the nations of the Western world have fewer and fewer children, no interest in actual children, and at the same time, the interest in the child is out of all proportions. Child, child psychology is in toys, children's clothes, books, etc. As soon as a divine child appears, however, the child destroyer and murderer appears too. As soon as Jesus Christ was born, <coughs> Herodes had all the young children killed. The archetype of the divine child, the hope of the world on one side, and the child murderer, the destroyer of all hope, on the other side, are archetypal polarities that belong together. In the field of sexual child abuse, it's nearly impossible <coughs> to distinguish between clinical observation and mythological images and tales. Some children, some children's, or some child psychologists, for instance, claim that children never lie concerning sexual child abuse, although we frequently experience how children make wrong accusations, often under pressure from one partner, for instance, in a divorce case. But mythologically, the child who never lies is a correct image. The divine child is innocent, truthful, and can never lie. So therefore saying a child never lies is mythologically correct, but concerning an actual child, it's of dubious value because every human being can lie, including children. Psychology, psychotherapy, and 
analysis all have a mythological background. A large part of our psychotherapeutic work is based on mythology. We help, for instance, the patient to create or find out the mythological background of his own life to create his personal mythology. The massa confusa, the meaningless chaos which seems to the patient to represent his own life and suffering, is turned through many hours of psychotherapeutic work into a meaningful mythological story or history, into a novel, a drama, a tragedy, or maybe even into a comedy. This is a part of a healing effect of psychotherapy, an ununderstandable, chaotic life becomes a meaningful biography. There are different psychological schools which give the patient different so-called explanation, so-called causal explanations for his suffering. And we psychotherapists really often believe ourselves that we are giving to a patient that what we are giving to the patient is a causal explanation of his life, then in reality we just give him a mythological possibility to bring some meaning into the mess of his life. There is Freudian mythology and Kleinian mythology and Adlerian mythology and Kohutian mythology and Jungian mythology, etc. The only um, advantage the Jungians have is that they know it's mythology. <laughs> they all make out of the meaningless story of a patient's life an interesting mythological biography. But the character, the quality of a particular mythology cannot be neglected and has a deep influence on our psychotherapeutic work. Not all mythologies are healthy. Some are sick distorted, one-sided, and can have a damaging influence. It was Dr. Hillman who pointed out in Rome two years ago, and again then at the International Congress for Analytical Psychology in Paris, that the classical analytical work is mainly based on the mythology of the child, and that therefore we turn our patients into children, into, into childish, irresponsible persons. James Hillman suspects that the mythology of the child, which dominates psychotherapy, usually leads to an undesirable infantilization of the psychotherapeutically treated people, unable to become responsible adult citizens. They remain, so he says, or become little children who continually complain about mama and papa. James Hillman was so disgusted by the damaging, one-sided, dominating mythology of the child in psychotherapy that he abandoned the work of analysis and psychotherapy altogether and declared it as immoral. However, if the doctors gave for a while a medicament with too many side effects, that does not mean that no medicaments should be given but only that the medicament has to be improved. I would call what Dr. Hillman did throwing out the baby with the bathwater. But at least Dr. Hillman helped us to think very deeply about what kind of mythology is leading our work and to find out how far is it helpful or damaging. And that is why I'm trying to reflect about the mythological side of our interest in sexual child abuse. Here we deal even with a very special kind of mythology of the child, namely with the mythology of the eternally abused child, which is very closely related to the mythology of the victim. So-called good healthy mythologies, if I might give them these banal adjectives, contain polarities, opposites. 
Archetypes can be understood as polar and are therefore represented by images of polarity. There is male and female, or puer et senex, parent and child, or God and Satan. The polarities are always the same archetype. Or heaven and hell, or Aphrodite and Ares, the wounded healer. Jesus Christ and Herodes, the victim and the victimizer. Archetypes are bipolar. But both poles are always appearing at the same time. Now, James Hillman is right, complaining about the fact that we work too much under the mythology of the child. A very one-sided mythology indeed. But things get even worse when we work mainly with the mythology of the child as only innocent, abused and victimized. I have to repeat over and over again that there exists in this world far too much and a tremendous amount of horrible sexual child abuse, which brings with it an unbelievable amount of suffering. And we have to do everything to prevent it, to stop it, or at least to attenuate it. The interest of the professionals and the public in this topic might help us to do more for its prevention, for instance. But it's our duty, too, to look at the mythological, psychological background of the present-day interest in child abuse. What kind <coughs> of need <coughs> this interest fulfills? What kind of mythology it stimulates? And what positive or negative results these mythologies might have? One of the myths behind our present-day interest in sexual child abuse is, as I said, the unipolar myth of the innocent, abused child and victim. And this myth does damage. It becomes difficult to study rigorously the actual facts. I said, for instance, in my first lecture at the C.G. Jung Institute, that in big cities, and no doubt, no doubt in the country too, Girls meet once in a while an exhibitionist and that I'm not 100% sure if this really is always so horribly damaging. The audience protested passionately. These innocent little girls are deeply wounded by the sight of an exhibitionist. There is nothing to discuss here and nothing to investigate. It's always becomes difficult if people say there's nothing to investigate anymore. That's the way it is. Or I mentioned that, as far as I remember from my childhood and observe today, that most boys have in their childhood once in a while been approached by somebody in a homosexual way. Maybe by a cousin or an uncle or a neighbor or an unknown man. But as far as I have seen and experienced, these homosexual gestures do not always provoke tremendous psychological damage, also statistically they would be under sexual child abuse. As far as I remember, we usually discussed these things with some interest among other boys, and that was about the end of it. Maybe it's different now, but as far as I see, with the children I know now, it's about the same. Then some woman in the audience called me a pervert. These innocent children, they said, have met Satan meaning a slightly abusive male, and therefore must have been deeply damaged. That I even raised the question, if not some of the so-called sexual child abuse might be less harmful than another, made me into a male chauvinist pig. The one-sided, unipolar mythology of the innocent child victim can even harm psychotherapeutic work with children or adults who were sexually abused. This is shown, for instance, in the way many therapists deal with the problem of the guilt feelings of these patients. Children who have been sexually abused feel, as you all know, very often guilty because they have the impression that what happened to them might have something to do with themselves too. Especially older children feel ambivalent towards abuse. They're sometimes not quite sure if they got some weak enjoyment out of it, or even if they encouraged the abuser. 
Now, many psychotherapists do not accept these guilt feelings as in any way legitimate. They insist over and over again that there cannot be any question of the slightest guilt and encourage the child to forget about it, to suppress it. This attitude of the therapist can be damaging to the psychological development of the child. The child is understood purely as a victim and any kind of attempt of the child <coughs> to take some responsibility for what happened or realize at least his or her ambivalence is wiped out. This fosters <coughs> a victim psychology onto the child, an attitude which consists in putting the blame for everything which happens on somebody else. The growing realization <coughs> in a child that he or she, in many things which happened, might at least partially be responsible to, or that he or she might have been torn between repulsion and attraction is nipped in the bud. The child as a human being is not taken seriously. It's only understood as a symbol, as an abused innocent child, as a victim and not as a human being with all its possibilities, polarities and contradicting drives. A lot depends, of course, of the age of the child at the time of the abuse. It's a completely different story if the child was four years old or 14 years old. And a lot depends if the abuse was purely horrible late or rape or gentle seduction, either it was tenderness or sheer sadism and brutality. As you all know, the sexual abusers are very seldom unknown strangers. They are mostly men who have some relation to the child, if not as fathers, fathers and maybe as uncles or cousins or neighbors or brothers. The abuse might be discovered by a third person, but the discovery is usually connected with something the child said or communicated. Therefore, these children often feel that they have betrayed the abuser, that they have done something harmful to somebody who might be near to them, close to them. This is especially painful when the abuser is very close, for instance, a well-liked stepfather or even father. The experts often advise the therapists to help these children to overcome the feeling of betrayal completely, forget about it. Again, these psychotherapists are maybe too much caught by the one-sided mythological image of the innocent, pure child and victim so that, they do, so that they do no more respect the actual psychological situation. And this situation is indeed often very tragic. These children are very often caught between two conflicting loyalties, the loyalty to themselves and the loyalty to people around them. The child had to tell, for instance, what the father or the stepfather did to him or her but at the same time, this means a betrayal to the maybe well-liked father or father figure. These children are in a conflict which cannot be solved. The psychotherapy should help these children to sustain and stand this tragic conflict. This would help them to mature. All our lives, children and adults, are full of tragic conflicts and psychotherapists of children or adults have to help their clients to stand these conflicts and so to grow, to develop and to individuate. By treating these sexually abused children as unable to stand a tragic conflict, we deprive them of their human creative possibilities and abuse them in the sense that we see in them not really human beings, but only one-sided archetypal symbols. Something of the same applies even to the treatment or dealing with offenders. Many of the men and women, but most, it's are mostly men, many of the men who abused little girls or boys claim that they actually loved these children, but that this love was just expressed physically too much. For many people who deal professionally with children, 
these for many people who deal professionally with children, children have certain certainly a physical attraction. Otherwise, they probably could not stand to be around children all the time. And therefore, very often, for instance, teachers who in a mild form approach pupils sexually are, at the same time, very good teachers, have a genuine love for the children. And these offenders defend their love strongly and feel in some way unjustly attacked. Now, in treating these offenders, we very often make, based on our one-sided mythology, two possible mistakes. On the one hand, we present their action as purely evil and try to persuade them that they were evildoers and should change their mind and their attitude completely. We see them as devils and want them to see themselves in the same way. Or, what's even worse, we again make them into victims. We tell them that we know by statistics and research that most child abusers have been as children abused and that their action, action therefore, are not really their responsibility. That their action is only the result of the fact that they have been victims as children. By doing that, we suppress their archetypal polarity. We don't treat them as human beings because we are, human beings are always partially victims and partially actors and therefore responsible to a, to a varying degree for whatever happens. Being caught in the unhealthy mythology which is often behind our interest and our dealings with child abuse has another consequence. I said at the beginning of my lecture that the part of this mythology or that part of this mythology is that we think we have found Satan in person that we begin to believe we have found the root of all evil, the so-called cause of most neurotic and psychotic development. This can turn us into fanatical missionaries. Lately in my control work, I often came across candidates who tried with a certain fanaticism to find out in every patient some sexual dramatic event in their childhood. When an incestuous dream appeared, they picked it up very eagerly and began questioning the patient if he or she doesn't remember some concrete incestuous happening in their childhood and some experience of sexual abuse. And sometimes the patient does not remember and just doesn't remember, but still sometime something must have happened. I've seen instances when the patient out of friendliness towards the analyst, finally admitted to some horrifying factual sexual experience as a child. Psychology is not mathematics or physics, but mythology. As I said at the beginning of my lecture, the psyche can only be caught or understood by symbolic images or mythological tales. But the kind of images or mythological tales which guide us is very personal and that's why we have to be very aware of what personally guides us in our work. We all have our personal mythology, mostly based on the, on the collective ruling mythology. And this mythology is never perfect, never completely balanced. It's always a little bit one-sided. Maybe, maybe that doesn't even matter so much, as long as we realize that it is mythology. As long as Freudians realize that their edible stories are mythologies, Coutians that are mirroring narcissism, true and false selves are mythological images, not scientific explanations. Jungians that are anima and animus are mythological figures, no more and no less. Having mythological images guides us, makes us feel at home. The difficulty is to show to, to our patients that we are un unable to explain their suffering we are, so to speak, only able to make it more bearable by providing them with mythological tales. But we have to be careful that our mythological base is not too one-sided, and so does damage, like the one-sided, innocent, abused child and victim psychology. If our psychotherapeutic analytical work is, however, based on a wide, all-embracing, multipolar mythology, our work will always be rewarding and fruitful, and the great creators of modern mythology, like Jung and Freud, have not lived and worked in vain. Thank you.